you know, I feel as if I'm a broken, I feel like a broken record. Because you see, we've done quite a number of launches before. And one of the questions that keep coming up is the question about what inspired this book. I mean, so it's a common question that keep coming up. What inspired this book? Give us a bit of a, you know, a journey through writing this book, a journey of your thought process and all of that. So if there are any of you who were here, in fact, I know Samuel, we were with him last night having the same discussion. So he's going to be subjected to hearing some of the same things that I spoke about yesterday, because of course the journey that uh, resulted in the writing of this book does not change. So for you, Tamolo, I really do apologize, my friend. And for those who've heard the story before, uh, including Rabe, Rabe Lani when I was there, she shot a documentary that was aired on SAPC One about three weeks ago. And of course, more than anybody else, she has heard the story far too many times. But uh, because there are some of you here who have not heard it at all, I think uh, it is very important that uh, key to introducing what the book is about, I first give you a very brief, um, a, a, a brief synopsis or rather a brief uh, reflection of what uh, inspired the writing of this book and uh, what inspired my journey as a person. Now, uh, Dr. Malulega, uh, Professor Malulega rather, is correct when he says that I, you know, politics, this book speaks a lot about uh, politics and particularly the goals of institutions of higher learning. In 2010, I, I matriculated in 2009, so in 2010 I went to Stellenbosch and uh, less than two weeks later I was back. I had left that institution and uh, I went to join civil society politics, worked in NGOs and so on, until in 2002, 2012 rather, I decided to go to Rhodes University and study. But uh, in 2013, I could not return back to school due to some very unforeseen uh, financial constraints that, that transpired way a bit too late for one to really do much. And uh, as a result of that, I then decided that I would go and you know, go back into civil, civic, uh, civil society politics. And uh, fortunately for me, an organization had been established uh, that the year before, 2012, by the Tamil Foundation. This organization is called the African Youth Coalition and it's basically a, 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 collect, a, a collective of various civil society, youth-led youth and youth-based civic society movements across the African continent. And uh, I had the very rare privilege of having led that institution as the Secretary General, right? But that's not the issue. What happened in 2013, in January, of course, the appointments happened. Uh, you know, I'm not a, I'm a Democrat who believes in these things of appointments. I do think from time to time they're quite very necessary. So I was a product of an appointment. My friends like to keep with me and say that uh, I can't claim to have ever been a leader of people because I've never been elected to any structure. I've always been appointed. So uh, when, when they want to deal with me and deal with my views, they tend to remind me of my appointments in every structure I've been part of. Uh, but uh, of course, it's not a problem to me because I do think that the most important thing, whether you are elected or appointed, is that the work gets done. So if a leader that's appointed or a leader that's elected gets the work done, that's what matters to me. And uh, so in 2013, I, 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 I proceeded with my work as the SG of the AYC. And around that time, in March last year, I decided that you know it does not make sense that you would be leading an organization of young people on the African continent, but you don't really go and engage with them in their own environments. So you see each other at conferences, at summits, at seminars, and all of that, but you never really go to, to go to their, to their own environments and understand their living conditions beyond just the theory that you would read or you know, just the story that you would be told. And as a result of that, I thought to myself, and you know, prior to that, I had spoken to another comrade of mine, I'm not sure if he's here, comrade Busan who has also just recently launched a very important uh, a submission called um, 20, years, 20 Years of Democracy Liberation Diaries. It's a, it's a collection of essays that looks into, critical essays that look into post-1994 politics and so on from, a, from young people, from women, from men, from leaders in, public, in the public sector, in the private sector and so on. So I, I do hope Busan is here and I hope he's going to be one of the people that during the course of this we are going to be engaging. I think it's got some very interesting views to give us about some of the submissions that were made in that particular book. And uh, you know, Busani had asked me last year to, to submit an essay for Liberation Diaries. And I wrote the first draft of the essay and I thought, okay, quite, you know, this is, this is it. I'm done with this and I sent it to Busani. But during, the, during that period, I then decided in March last year to go around, take a, 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 a one woman a trip across the Sadek region, right? And um, of course, being a student, I, I had no resources to do that. I would obviously have to take public transportation, uh, your taxis and so on. And um, so I took, this, I took this trip around the Southern region, beginning in Swaziland, where I was hosted by a group of young people, young comrades of mine. 
uh, from an organization called Swayoko. And I want to believe that most of you being students and being comrades, you would know at least a bit about the Swaziland struggle to know what Swayoko is and what its struggles are and what its objectives are. But I was hosted by these young comrades, right? So when I arrived in Swaziland, I was supposed to spend four days there. And I indicated to comrades that when I get there, I would like to be taken across, you know, on a trip across Swaziland and all of that. We show the nice scenery and so on. But that night when I arrived, these comrades said to me, you know, I woke up the following morning and they said to me, Malaika, we are unfortunately not going to be able to show you, uh, you know, to, to travel with you around Swaziland. And I asked them what the reason for that was. And I was informed that, uh, you know, police said to me, Malaika, part of the reason why we can't show you, we can't travel with you anyway, is because we are actually underground. And I thought, underground what? What are you talking about? And God said to me, you know, we are underground, we are, all of us, as you see us here, of course we are activists, but we are hiding from the regime. And I thought, hiding from the regime, why? He said to me, you know, uh, very recently we've all just been released from prison. All of us were arrested here as the leadership and the NEC of Swayoko, and we've just recently been released from prison, and that is why we are hiding now, because we've also done some things post that release that uh, have angered and ruffled feathers with the regime. And as a result of that, we have had to go underground. Now you must understand, for me, being a South African, having been born here, and I was 21 at the time last year, I could not comprehend what it means for a 21-year-old to be underground anyway. I mean, I, I, of course, our, his, our apartheid history is very rich and it's very recent, but I never had to live through that kind of an experience. So the idea that someone my age, my own peer, could actually be underground was very shocking to me. So I had to suspend my anger for a while, about the fact that I couldn't travel around Swaziland and try to ascertain what exactly is this, you know, listen to the stories of these young people. And these young kids in Swaziland, 20 year olds, 21 year olds, 22 year olds, then began to narrate to me some of the struggles that they are facing in their own country, right? They were telling me about the brutality that they are subjected to, the kind of torture that they are subjected to in the hands, or rather that they suffer in the hands of the police. And you know, just some of the things that I, I, I cannot even begin to comprehend right now, how they were able to live through that. The fact that some of them, their parents have died and they were not there to even bury them on the grounds that they were, you know, they were hiding from, from the regime. Some of them have been in prison more than 11 times. One of them, um, um, what is this? Um, um, Palala, police in Palala, had been in prison at that time 11 times. We're talking here about somebody, you know, below the age of 24, had been arrested more than 11 times. He had just come back from prison when I went to Flazilet. And I sat there listening to these young people telling me about all of these, these stories of theirs, the tragedies that they go through, the struggles that they are waging on a continuous, on an everyday basis, the revolution that so many of us sit here and theorize about, which they live every day of their lives. And uh, I left Brazil about four days later and went to Mozambique. And interestingly, in Mozambique, I was hosted by a family of, um, a family of four, they, are the, they call them Mnyarezas, right? The Mnyareza family hosted me in, so in Mozambique in a very small township just near uh, Costa do Sol. Those of you who are familiar with Mozambique would know that township. But it's a township near Costa do Sol, and I was hosted by the Mnyareza family, which interestingly is not from Mozambique. They are not originally Mozambique. They are a Rwandese family. They had been born, of course, they had lived in Rwanda for the longest of times until in 1994, following the genocide, and I, I'm not going to go into that because I want to believe that we're all at least a bit conversant on some of the issues that transpired in Rwanda in 1994. But there was a genocide in, in, in Rwanda in 1994, and ethnic minority was being wiped out there. The people were being wiped out and so on by you know, the militia, some of the people, members of the army and so on. And the Mujareza family was part of that, so they had also fled to Rwanda following the genocide. They had lost some members of the family in the process and had you know, traveled down to Tanzania, to Malawi until ultimately they settled in Mozambique. Now what is interesting about the story about the Mirata family, and it's going to tie into the, the, the issue about the book, is that the person who was narrating the story to me was at that time about 26, 27. Patrick, I think it was about 26, 27 years at that time. And uh, I found it quite profound that a 26 year old had lived to tell that kind of a story and had seen the kind of brutalities that we can only imagine. And that some of us, and you know, those of us born in the 1990s in particular, cannot even to begin to, you know, to imagine because we don't know what it's like. We don't know, we've not seen the harsh brutality that comes with people being arrested, people being massacred right before our eyes. We've not had to see things like that. So I traveled then across to, some, to Zambia, to Zimbabwe, all the way up to Angola until I had to come back home because I did not have enough money. 
uh, to continue with the trip. I could not go to the islands, your you Mauritius and all of that. So I came back after having gone to about nine, eight or nine countries. And upon arrival in South Africa, I started thinking a lot about some of these stories that I had had narrated by young people across the Sartre region. And I thought that it's prudent that one wants to write a, you know, a journal of some sort to diarize, to, to rather to, to document these, these experiences, to document this journey and these stories that I had into some kind of a journal. And it was in writing, in the, as I began to write that journal, I then started to ask myself a question that became critical to the writing of this book, which was the question of what exactly, you know, what is the common thread between all of these stories, between the stories I had from the comrades of Swayoko in, in Swaziland, between the story of Patrick in Mozambique, between the story of Charles in Zimbabwe, who had, you know, his family had lost everything you know, over the past few years, and so on and so forth, and other stories that I had across the region. And one of the things that I found to be a common thread, of course, the first was that many of them were narrated by young people, but the second was that most of these stories were taking place in an environment that was supposed to have either been post independence or post apartheid as in our case. And yet despite the fact that all of these people had lived during dispensations that ought to be democratic, they continued to experience stories or you know, they continue to live through experiences that I believe ought not to be part of a story of democracy or a story of independence. And it was then that I then began to think about in South Africa, when you bring this into the context of South Africa, what are the stories that we have to tell? What are the lived experiences of our post-1994 dispensation? And, uh, you know, interestingly, this came about, these kinds of questions came about at a time when there was a very popular theme last year. You would remember it. There was a very popular theme going during the rounds about a good story to tell, right? You know, so we'd speak about everything and we'd say we've got a good story to tell. But uh, from where I was sitting, and I mean, it's an analysis that, that, that is debatable. From where I was sitting, a lot of this, this narrative on this good story to tell was very numerical. So it was, an, it, was, it was numerical in the sense that it was percentages and numbers in the main. So it was a story about, you know, in 1994, from 1994 to 2013, we now have three million more black people who are able to access institutions of higher learning, or we've got, you know, five, more, five million more people have now got electricity, uh, 10,000 more houses in a particular area now have got access to water and sanitation and so on. There were stories about numbers about what, what had transformed in terms of numbers. But I did not feel that these stories were talking about the real lived experiences of those numbers. So even though indeed there were more black people that were able to enter these white towers of white supremacy like Rhodes University where I am studying, even though there were numbers that had increased, what, does, what do the lived experiences of the people who are in those institutions, what do they represent? Do those represent, is the transformation that is numerical inversely or directly proportional? to the transformation that I believe ought to be at the level of the content and the lived experiences of people. And when I started to think about this, I then realized that in very many ways, at the, at the heart of the issue, the story of transformation, there are a lot of things that remain untransformed. And all of them are born out of two main, two, two main factors. The first being, of course, the issue of the systematic, the brutal, and the ongoing economic dispossession that is happening in our country. The taking away of the land of black people, the natives of this country, the, the, the marginalization of black people in particular from economic activity in our country, the sidelining of our people and putting them on the periphery of economic, you know, of economic activity, of the rate growing of the economy outside being just being consumers and so on. So that is the first dispossession that is happening in our country. But the second dispossession that was born in our country is an even deeper dispossession that I think in very many ways the narratives that we speak about have not touched on this. And that is the very disposition of the humanness of black people. The disposition of the humanness of black people that has been going on and that continues to manifest even in this post-1994 dispensation. And by the disposition of the humanness of black people, I'm not only speaking about you know, black people being deprived of you know, staying in, 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 in environments that I think ought to be conducive for growth, ought to be conducive for economic activity and so on. I'm speaking also about the dispossession that has led to the lack of identity that black people continue to be subjected to in post-1994 post dispensation. The fact that in 2004, 2014, as we see, the curriculum, the, the, the academic curriculum of our institutions <laughs> continue to reflect a colonial reality. The fact that you, as, a, as, a, as an African child, when you go, in, you know, when you want a better school, for example, you would have to go to a farm model C school, which is often very far from the townships. And once you get there, 
the curriculum that you learn, because the books that you read, for example, you read books uh, of people you can't even, you know, of, of environments you can't even relate with. Uh, books about Romeo's and Juliet's. And I suppose there are people who like Shakespeare here, and I, I mean, I'm, I appreciate literature, I love reading. But the reality of the situation is that most of these books that we do, that we do interact with, are books that are very divorced from our reality. So divorced, in fact, that half the names that are there we can't even pronounce. I know for one thing, I cannot pronounce the same name of this Romeo, I don't know if it's a Montague, Montagu, or whatever, and there's a Juliet, there's a Capulet, whatever the case, whatever the names may be. So divorced are we from that reality that even at the level of identifying the characters there, we battle with those things. And this is something that we then carry on. You know, it begins in primary school, it carries on into our high school, and right through to our institutions of higher learning, where the systematic dispossession of the humanness of black people continues to find itself being manifested where you go into this institution of learning and the history of Africa, the history of black people in particular, continues to be vulgarized, continues to be bastardized, primarily on the basis that it's written by everybody else but Africans and black people themselves. Yeah. And so, and so, <laughs> and so having, having lived through this, having, you know, been one who has lived through it, interacted with this at a more direct and a personal level. I then began to say, perhaps a new type of narrative, hey, we must problematize this good story. We do not neglect, and we, we, you know, we would be economizing with the truth if we were to say that there has not been any changes. I think anybody who sits here and says 1994 has changed nothing would be economizing with the truth. Because there have been some kinds of changes you know, since 1994. The, the political breakthrough did bring some changes. But there are other issues which I believe are neglected or taken for granted, which we have not began to even speak about. Often because, you know, and I think this is a thing of black people in particular, we tend to be very apologetic about our realities, about our own narratives. We tend to not want to offend. We tend to be a bit too careful when we speak because we don't want to offend, to offend you know, our white friends, our, our, our institutions, and so on and so forth. We are afraid we'll be kicked out of roads if you say things like this. We'll be kicked out of UJ if you say things like this. Because although there are many of us in these institutions now, they continue to be very, yeah, very white in their, in, 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 in their, in their outlook. And very reactionary to be out to, to put it more bluntly. So, And so I think that Members of the Born Free, what it does more than anything else, Members of the Born Free is not a, Members of the Born Free is not a, I don't want to sit here and claim monopoly of intelligence. You know, I realize that in our country we are very sensitive about this issue of intelligence. Uh, it's measured by very many things. Of now late, we want to even measure it by whether or not one has got a PhD. If you don't have a PhD, you will be exposed and almost as if the things you have said before, you know, they don't have any sense of legitimacy. So we must be very careful about uh, how we want to get into this intellectual space and engage, lest we be reminded that we don't have PhDs yet. But uh, I want to believe, uh, at least we will be honest enough to say we don't have PhDs, some of us. Uh, but, uh, no, of course, uh, I don't want you to start thinking about that issue, because I can see you're already thinking about that issue, it's not about that. But, uh, so, so I think Members of Born Free is not necessarily a, I mean, look, I've had people like the, the former deputy president that the president says that, you know, this is a work of a 22-year-old intellectual and so on. I don't know. I, maybe if, I think if there are different strands of intellectualism, I may fit into one of them. Uh, in Blackwash, we had a very interesting term that we used to say. We used to call ourselves hobo intellectuals. You know, we said we are hobo intellectuals. As we belong nowhere, we are just hobos roaming around. And we are those kinds of intellectuals. Nobody can, you know, tie us to any institution, tie us to any... I know any any formal anything. We are just hobos, but we are intellectuals. It was very popular in, the, in 2010 when we thought we were very radical. But uh, you know, so so there's that. So if there is any category of intelligence that one would want to locate this this this, this submission to, it's fine. But what I want members of the country to do, and I think it has at least been able to do this uh, to some degree, is to begin to ask important questions is to raise debates about issues that we have taken for granted and that we have been afraid to say for too long. And over and above all, it's to begin to celebrate people that we often don't. I mean, those of you who have read my book will know that I speak about two people in particular there who have shaped my thinking, who have shaped me into the person that I've become. I speak about my grandmother, Matsiriso, she's sitting over there in the brown... <laughs> I speak about uh, Matsiriso, my grandmother, Kimiza Mama. 
And then I speak about my mother, the beautiful lady in the green dress. Please stand up. <laughs> celebrate and to tell stories of people who often do not get their stories told. You know, in South Africa, we've got an obsession with idolizing certain people. And so everything we speak about, we talk about those people, struggling heroes, is this one. In the Black Consciousness block, we always speak about Steve Biko, as if there was never anybody else but Biko. We speak about Sobu Ugwe. In the ANC, we will speak about Mandela and Tam and all of that. But there are people who have played an important role, a critical role, not just in the struggle for liberation, but in the ongoing struggle as well of raising young, strong black people, young, strong black children who do not have to recover from their childhoods like many of us are doing. And these are some of the women that I think ought to be celebrated. It's not done enough. So members of the Point Free does just that. I want to be, uh, I'm not going to go into detail about what the book contains because then you will not buy the book and I will not have my pull of evil, which is not part of the plan. <laughs> but I want to read, I want to read uh, something to you from the book, which is one of my, perhaps, I don't know if it's my favorite chapter, but I think this is one chapter where I want to believe uh, captures a lot about what this book is about, but raises also some important debates and discussions. Uh, there are some of you here, I know Yamkela is going to be a bit offended about some of the things I'm going to say here. Yamkela, I apologize in advance. And, uh, but it's important that this story does get told. So I'm going to read for you, those of you who've got the book, it's on page, it starts on page 111. It's the chapter that says, How Stellenbosch University Changed Me. And I'm going to read, I think, I, I, I tend to speak a bit fast, but I do believe that you'll be able to hear me. I think I'm a bit coherent enough that you'll be able to hear me. So page 111 of the book reads as follows. <laughs> I'm sorry, I do realize it's the wrong page. It's 117. It's 117 and the title of that chapter is uh, Searching for a Political Home in the Abyss, the Blackwash and SNI Experience. That's page 117 and it reads as follows. I had always known that I would have a role to play in the development of black people, but it was not until I walked out of the gates of Stellenbosch University that I knew exactly how I would make my mark in our struggle. I would join a black consciousness organization and serve in its communications department. I was passionate about writing and communicating with people, and I wanted to use my passion and talent to rewrite the black narrative. On June 16, 2010, I attended a political event at Regina Mundi in Soweto, where I met a man who would play a critical role in my life. His name is Andile Mwetang. I had been an avid reader of Andile's Bolega column in the Soweto. I found Andile to be a very interesting and engaging individual. He had been friends with my mother at some point, and it was she who had introduced me to his journal, New Frank Talk, which I had thoroughly enjoyed and found extremely radical. Andile was with a group of young people when I met him. They belonged to a radical black consciousness movement based in Soweto called Blackwash. Blackwash had been established by a group of radical black conscious feminists who had met at Rhodes University in Grahamstown years before. The initial idea was for the organization to become a movement for black women, but later that idea was abandoned and Blackwash became a movement for young, angry and militant young people who wanted to revive and to give a radical face to the comatose, swollen black consciousness movement. I knew immediately upon meeting the group that I wanted to join Blackwash. That first night, we sat discussing the writings, the writings of Bantu Steve Biko for hours. I had read his book, I Write What I Like, which my mother had bought for me as a present for my birthday. The awkwardness that often occurs when one, when one meets a group of strangers was non-existent. From the first point of introductions, we got along like long-lost like long friends. My horrendous experience at Stellenbosch University had transformed me into a very angry individual. I was angry at myself for having applied to study at the institution. I was angry at the institution for having accepted my application. I was angry at my mother for not warning me about the potential danger that lay ahead of me in the Western Cape, the danger of facing an untransformed community of conservative right-wing Afrikaners. Above all, I was angry at the Rainbow Nation. Once again, I was angry at the Rainbow Nation once again. I had fallen for the romantic rhetoric as a child, believing that Model C schools were a haven for everyone. And there I was again, falling for the same lie that institutions of high learning are accommodating of everyone, irrespective of class background or ideological orientation. I was angry at the ANC-led government for painting a false picture of South Africa. A South Africa of genuine social cohesion and racial harmony did not exist. 
It does not exist. Blackwash, with its anti-white politics, was exactly the kind of movement an 18-year-old angry black child from the township could identify with. Because there are times when the only weapon a black child can use to fight against a system, a system that dehumanizes her is to be so angry that she is left with no choice but to dare to be alive. Anger, for many of us, has been a driver of our ideas, at times even more so than our love for our people. Within a few weeks of joining the organization, I was already in the inner circle. Andile was the ultimate leader of the movement, followed by two of its founders, Zandi, Zandi Khadebe and Ngabala Zemanzi, who were both graduated from Rhodes University with master's and honors degrees respectively. Zandi and Nesh were extremely intelligent young women with a strong passion for the black struggle. They took me under their wings, feeding me literature that had inspired their thinking and politics. I was introduced to the writings of Asha, Asata Shaku, a radical, a radical African-American woman who is exiled in Cuba. Asata is one of the leading figures of the Black Panther movement, which emerged in the later stages of the civil rights movement in the United States of America. It advocated for the use of weapon and violence. On a number of occasions, these threats were made good. The militant and radical factions demonstrated to the masses that a small segment of the civil society movement had the capacity to apply brute force where necessary. Asata was arrested by the American government on a false charge of murder and subsequently escaped prison to find refuge at Fidel Castro's anti-imperial government. Currently on the Federal Bureau of Investigation's most wanted list and with a price tag on her head, Asata still resides in Cuba, where the socialist government is protecting her from the claws of US intelligence. I was also introduced to the writings of Franz Fanon, Sikok Ture, Frank B. Wilderson, Dr. Shinwezu, and many other critical and radical writers with a particular focus on defining the nervous conditions of blackness. Fanon described the colonial position as being a sickness. I was soon made an administrator of the movement, tasked with ensuring the smooth running of day-to-day -day duties, such as responding to emails and writing press statements. When it was discovered that I was gifted in the art of writing, Andila asked me and Nash to assist him with research and the editing of New Frank Talk. I was over the moon. New Frank Talk was a popular journal doing very well in terms of sales. It was a great honor for me to be entrusted with assisting its, edit its editor with its researching and writing. Shortly after beginning to assist Nash with New Frank Talk, I was asked by Andila to participate in a project called the September National Imbizo. The SNI had been based on Facebook when people who shared the same views as Blackwash proposed a national conference where radical black minds would converge to plot a path for the black struggle. I agreed. A week later, a task team for SNI was appointed and a meeting was held at Mulezani High School in Soweto. The task team was divided into four departments. The content and ideological work, finance and fundraising, logistics and marketing, as well as public relations. Andile advised me to join the content and ideological work team which was comprised of three other people, namely myself, Nash, and a, and a very bold man named Jackie Shandu. The four of us were responsible for political work and to some degree governance. Our immediate mandate was to draft discussion documents for the SNI, which we had decided would take place that September, less than three months away. How we imagined we would pull this off defies logic. Preparations for the SNI began after the meeting in Molezani. The content and ideological work team met regularly at Andila's office in Bramfontein to discuss and brainstorm the discussion documents. It was during this period of the drafting of documents that I was appointed as the Secretary General of the SNI. I became the, the signatory on the SNI bank accounts and sat in the driving seat of power within the organization. I knew that there were people who were displeased about my quick rise to power within the movement, but at that time I believed I'd end my position. I was the youngest member of the Corps and one of the most committed. By then, I was enrolled at the University of South Africa, a long-distance learning institution. I had a lot of time on my hands, and as I didn't have to attend any lectures, as I didn't have to attend any lectures, all that time was dedicated to the work of the SNI and Blackwash. The movement had become my life. Shortly before the end of the 2010 FIFA Soccer World Cup tournament hosted in South Africa, Blackwash decided to run an anti-Afrophobia campaign across the country. This campaign was informed by reports and speculation that the so-called xenophobic violence of 2008 would reoccur just after the tournament. Being a black consciousness and pan-Africanist movement, we decided that we would not allow a situation where our African brothers and sisters would find themselves at the mercy of angry South African mobs without doing our best to avert the potential catastrophe. After a few days of brainstorming, we had a coherent plan of action and a solid program. We decided to run a political education campaign on the streets to, ed to educate ordinary citizens of our country about why African nationals shouldn't be attacked. We prepared pamphlets from Andile's office and various internet cafes across the central business district. 
Blackwash didn't have an office, so we relied on our own equipment, such as laptops and cell phones, etc. For, for access to the internet, we relied on internet cafes and handlers office. The campaign was called Singamakwarekwaresolke, meaning we are all foreigners. Amakwarekwara is a derogatory term that is often used in townships to refer to non-South Africans. The tragedy about this labeling is that it is used selectively. Whites who are not natives of our country are never called or referred to as Amakwarekwe. It is only blacks who are given this dehumanizing label. By calling the campaign Singamakwarekwara Sonke, we wanted to expose just how ridiculous it is to call our own people that, since all Africans are one. Singamakwarekwara Sonke was marketed and popularized on social media. The page created specifically for the campaign had almost 3,000 followers, and the majority of them identified with the politics of blackwash. The campaign seemed to have the support of many people, and we were convinced that on the day of national action, we'd have masses on the streets. If I knew then what I know now about social media and its ability to deceive, I would never have, it, I would have insisted that we work closely, we work harder at mobilizing established community-based organizations and NGOs with similar politics to our own. But at that time, I was naive, believing that the social media numbers would translate to numbers on the ground. It was not to be. On the day scheduled for mass action across the country, with campaigns happening across major cities in all provinces, a group of us converged at Mary Fitzgerald Square in Newtown, Johannesburg. We had expected at least 100 people to join us in Gauteng, but fewer than 50 people arrived, and most of whom had been in an organizing committee of the campaign. It was a disappointing turnout. Andy made the suggestion that we all we call the protest off, but we were able to convince him that it was not the numbers that counted, but the message we were sending out. Eventually, he agreed that we'd have to find, we'd find a way to deploy people to critical areas to hang out pamphlets and engage the people on the issues we were raising. Three groups of four were assembled. One would go to Bree Taxi Rank, another to North Taxi Rank, and another one to Hilco. We had wanted to go to Deep Sluot, where the epicenter of the 2000, 2008 xenophobic attacks happened, but we did not have the necessary numbers, and we knew just how dangerous it would be to attempt to go there when we were so few. Three of my colleagues and I were deployed to North Taxi Rank, which is now known as MTN Taxi Rank, in the Johannesburg CBD. It was me, Andy Lemutama, Marachera Wandata, and a young woman named Katlego who had traveled from the valley. We began to distribute the pamphlets to, commu to commuters and taxi drivers, with Andy and me speaking to people one by one, telling them why it was wrong to attack and kill our African brothers and sisters. But most of the people, li mo most of the people listened, but some were very hostile and told us to go to hell. One taxi driver confronted me and in a very angry voice said, the reason you want us not to kill these people is because we are being fucked by Nigerians. At this, Antile and Marachere ran to my defense. Not long after that, the three of us were grabbed, were grabbed by the collars of our sheds by three armed men. We were dragged up the stairs to a room near the taxi rank. Our pamphlets were confiscated. We were subjected to an interrogation for what felt like decades. The three men saw at us, intimidated us, and threatened to assault us. They accused us of wanting to turn the country into a haven for foreigners, who they accused of being responsible for the escalating crime levels of and unemployment. Eventually, they let us go, but they kept our pamphlets. I was 18 years old at the time, terrified beyond measure, hungry, cold, and feeling disappointed by the refusal of our people to understand the importance of our cause. We met up with the rest of the group at Nikki's Oasis, a small restaurant and bar just across the market theater. That night, we sat and discussed the state of our continent. We all felt extremely dejected. That was one of the first and many moments in my life where I learned that it was going to be a very long walk to mental freedom for our people. The sheer magnitude of resentment expressed towards our people reflected more than just the conditions of inequalities that were at the heart of Afrophobia that were steadily increasing in the country. It was a it was a vivid picture. It was a picture it was a vivid picture of a people deeply colonized. My idealism my belief in the inherent goodness of black people was tested greatly on that day. And as we said, conducting a post-mortem on our failed campaign, I could see clearly the hard work that awaited us, work that we might, we, we might not manage to get, through, to, to get through in our lifetime. By the time we left Nikki's oasis, we were in a state of defeatism, engulfed by sadness. I close at this, part, at this point. Now, that chapter, of course, is personal, right? It's a personal narrative of what transpired in some of the work that we were doing with our handling and blackwash and so on. But it speaks to a much bigger, it speaks to much bigger politics. And I want to believe that there are quite a number of student activists here, former student activists, and some of you who are students. And I keep using you as an example, like I did yesterday, and I'm going to do it again today. 
you have led young people, you have led campaigns, you have tried to mobilize young people. And I think more than anybody else, you understand better the difficulties that come with trying to make people see the essence of your cause when they really just don't want to, or when they've been conditioned not to believe so. How you want to mobilize students to you know, go on strike and all of that, and the institution threatens them with suspensions and expulsions. And ultimately, the students have to then say, you know what, it's us, it's our degrees or SASCO. So we're not going to choose SASCO over our degrees. Ultimately, the, you know, the momentum dies down and things like that. And I think that's one of the narratives that, one of the things that speak, that I speak to a lot in the members of Bonfrey is primarily that issue. How so many of us get into these kinds of politics very excited. I mean, I'm with the African Union now, and when I started working, you know, getting there, working in their programs, I thought, you know, this reactionary institution of conservative old people, we are going to go there, we are energetic, we are young, we are very key, we are going to change these things. And you get into those kinds of spaces and you realize that transformation is an ongoing process. It is very slow. You are working with people who are resistant to change, not just the institutions themselves, but even the people who are operating and running these institutions. And this is some of the things that come out in Memoirs of a Born Free. I will not speak to many others, because like I said, I need you to help me with my economic freedom. So I need you to buy the book and get me my polo vivo. I will close off at this and uh, hand over to the great professor. Thank you.